Welcome to Teach Me a Lesson. I am Elliot GB. And first off, as always, I want to thank you so much for checking out the podcast, whether you're listening, uh, whether you're watching, whether you're reading the transcripts somehow. I didn't put out transcripts, but if someone's doing that, that's cool too, I guess. Hey, whatever floats your boat. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that. You know, I've said it before and I'll say it again. We live in the future. You could have the world at your fingertips. You could be watching doing playing anything you want right now and you have chosen to spend it here with me and the people i enjoy talking to and i think that's dope so thank you so much really appreciate it couldn't do it without you now if you could do me a favor and make sure you're subscribed or following wherever you are watching or listening to this or reading the transcript subscribe there too if you are on youtube also make sure to hit that like button on the video it would really help out a lot help get some more eyes on the podcast uh also if you could just share too, tell people hey i enjoy this or share some posts Uh, That would be dope as well. Also, rate and review Apple Podcasts and now Spotify. You can review as well. So go ahead and give it that five stars, four stars, uh, three stars, and anything lower than that. You can just email me and we'll talk about it like adults. And also make sure to follow the podcast on all social media platforms at TMALpod. That is Instagram and Twitter. And then uh, TikTok, it's Teach Me a Lesson Pod. Again, TMALpod on Instagram and Twitter. Teach Me a Lesson Pod on TikTok. We are also on Facebook under Teach Me a Lesson Pod, where you can also now listen to the episode straight on Facebook off of your phone. I don't think you can do it on desktop yet, but on your phone, you can listen to the episodes there if you don't want to go anywhere else. Uh, if you just want to stay in that metaverse, baby. Uh-oh, topical alert. Anyways, uh, also, if you want to support the podcast, uh, if you want to go a step further in supporting the podcast, I should say, Check out patreon.com slash Elliot GB. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm pointing to the sign right there. Uh, It is patreon.com slash E-L-L-I-O-T-T-G-B. And that is my personal Patreon where for just three bucks a month, you can show your support, but also for $5 a month, you can get bonus content for each episode. There's stuff I got to cut out. I got to do it just for time. I don't want to. It's all great. But for time, I got to cut some of it out. So for $5 a month, you get access to that. And that includes if you sign up right now. Includes the backlog of all the episodes before this. You get all of that great content. I think for Chris's episode, the bonus content is like as long as the actual episode. So it's like, you're getting two for the price of one here. Come on. Uh, But yeah, check that out. Patreon.com slash E-L-L-I-O-T-T-G-B. Yeah, that's about it. Um, I'm just kind of rushing through. I want to get to this great episode i don't want it to be too long um this is a great conversation uh with a great good, just a great all-around guy a good comic very funny comic very nurturing and welcoming to newer comics and and kind of passing on game and this and that and someone who i met in seattle and i'm just thankful to know but yeah uh so great conversation with a very great guy i hope you enjoy Derek sheen yeah the chicago chicago summer is probably the like that was the worst I've ever felt in my life. And I've been there a bunch in the summertime, but like it never changes. It's always like a hundred percent humidity and a hundred plus degrees. So it's just choking hot and wet and no, everyone's miserable and the violence index just goes through the roof because people are just short tempered. Yeah. Oh, it's the worst. I watched rain come out of the sky and never touched the ground. Like it just <laughs> evaporated before it hit the ground. So there was just this thick bank of steam downtown. And people were like choking to get indoors. And then it, but it wasn't any any cooler indoors. Like it was still hot and wet indoors because everyone was inside just steaming. You couldn't get any relief. It was the worst feeling. I'm like, this is what it's going to be like when we die. Like when the earth heats up, this is going to be like that everywhere. Just choking. You're in a 31 flavors and all they do is they're just like, we just have cups. Just scoop. Just you're going to get milk. You're just going to get flavored milk. <laughs> you're getting soup today, baby. We're a soup spot now. Remember, like, was it last year that we had that huge, like that shitty, like that heat wave where, you know, it was in the upper, like upper middle hundreds for six or seven days, right? Yeah. And, you know, 100, 102 to 106 every day, uh, punishing. And you like every place, their air conditioning units went out. All these ice cream places were like, we're closed because our coolers broke. And that's here. 
Like now make it now make it ninety percent humidity. Yeah. Ugh. 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 I hate it. Maybe hate that's it how that's how it should be rebranded. It's not a you know how you want to leave the world for your children and this and that. it's like think about the ice cream. All right, there will be no more ice cream if we keep this up. All <laughs> that, the coolers will go out. That's the selling point for climate change. You have yeah. to get people in a at a place where they actually care about something, which is being inconvenienced by not having available sugar. Exactly. Exactly. Ask someone, what's your favorite flavor? And then oh everyone has a favorite flavor. That's the thing. Freedom. Every <laughs> <laughs> Now imagine a world where you can't get that flavor. And that's where, and I say that to everyone in a car. <laughs> everyone on a bus, I'm like, you get free ice cream. But everyone in a car by themselves, I'm like, you're part of the problem. You're part of the problem. There's you not going to be any more prowling. You are killing Ben and Jerry right now, and I hope you're fucking <laughs> happy about it. Hope you like melted candy. <laughs> Enjoy that. Piece of Fuck, shit. You, <laughs> fucking carbon footprint piece of shit. <laughs> All right, well, let's uh I say let's hop into it. What uh Yeah. What do you want to talk about today? Well, so um you the, the premise is uh a lesson that I've learned. Right? Yes. And and I really racked my brain over like what would be like I mean, you know, I've learned a, a, of course just being an adult, I I've, I've learned a lot of things, you know. I mean, mm-hmm. there's a lot of lessons I've learned, but man, one thing really kept pounding at my brain because it is like a, it's a, it was a really, a really big lesson. And it was a hard one that I had to learn. Um, and it is about, um, it's about valuing friendship, uh, oh. which I, you know, you think you have a handle on it, but, uh, and, it, and it's not just the valuation of friendship, but it is like, I guess the lesson is, is sort of multi-sided. Right. Mm-hmm. Because um, it wasn't just a lesson about the value of friendship. It was a lesson about my value systems as well and how I put certain things over um, my friendships and my my loyalties and my um, my trust. Sometimes in uh, in the uh, in the event that there might have been an opportunity available for me. And then I would risk those things because I didn't understand the the deeper value of having a relationship with someone. And so, you know, I would take these risks and everybody does it. I mean, everybody gets to a place where, you know, you might not tell your friend about a particular, like as a, as a comic or an entertainer, you might not tell your friend about an opportunity because it gives you an extra space to get closer to that thing so hey there's an audition but i'm not telling them about it because i don't Mm. want them to get to that and then it's another guy i gotta worry about that's one level but um i fucked up on a monumental level and it really like really made me um really made me uh, uh, uh dig deep down inside myself and see what my value systems were and i had to reset things and and I'll I'll wrestle with it forever because I lost, I actually lost friends. Like they, you know, pe- the the people in in question like hate me, hate me, mm-hmm. and and it was my you know it's an earned thing. I did it on my own. So, and they were really good friends. Um, but the situation was uh, so, <clears throat> and I won't mention names. I'll keep everybody out of it. But I'm sure when I start to describe the situation, you'll go. Oh, I know that person or I know that person, but um, mm. just so I don't ruin anything else for anybody else. Um, air it. I, I say air it out, man. Let's just air turn it, it out. into the, the Dirty Laundry <laughs> podcast. Name names. Well, that is another thing I learned is that um, uh, and, at, and at 52, it, it, it was a lesson I learned later in life is that um, when you shit talk, it's always going to get back. It's always somehow it's going to seep out through the pores of your peer group and it's going to reach the other person. It just inevitably, it always happens. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, um, I, I was very desperate at this point in my career and I use career very loosely um, to like get back out on the road and, um, and do some new things and try some new places. And an opportunity was presented to me 
because a friend of mine, uh, his mom was real sick and she was battling cancer and he um, backed out of a tour. And uh, it was a tour that um, then an idiot put together and a kind of unlikable idiot at the time. And, uh, and he called me and said, hey, um, my buddy whose mom was dying was like, hey, I can't do this gig. Um, and I'm hoping maybe you could fill it in for me and, and do the shows. And it'd be a good opportunity for you because you'll get out on the road and see some new places. And you've been talking about how you want to get into new markets. And so if you could do that for me, it'd be great. And I trust you and you'll, I know you'll do well. Now, uh, of course, it's my friend. I want to do that. But on the other side of it, I saw the opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. This is a great opportunity. But the problem was the dudes I would be on tour with were all kind of problematic and uh and 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 a couple of them uh were publicly going through a, a fairly um uh a real shitty character arc that would uh one of them had um had publicly uh started targeting uh a local writer and had uh started a second like a fake twitter account for this person mm -hmm. and was uh just doing a lot of shitty like weight shaming and rape jokes at them because they just didn't like their politics and uh and doing it anonymously and they got I, outed i know if you're already kind of going down that road there's not a lot of self-awareness but i think making the fake account because it it's you know it's not super hard to make an account but there are a few steps you have to like verify an email so you have to like come up with it you know do all yeah. of that start it and then and then wait for the email to come through then click i think at some point that's where you should be like you know what maybe i'm doing a little too much and twitter this is like kind of before twitter had a policy about you know you know faking a celebrity account yeah, they didn't really have that. You could do that as a parody thing. They're like, "Oh, it's satire," but yeah, yeah, but this was incredibly mean spirited and not satire. Not to mention the fact that the other dude uh, that that would be on the tour wasn't really a comic; he just had a car. Mm. But they had booked <laughs> about three weeks worth of work at all these places, and I had this. I I knew that I was making a bad choice because the person that was being targeted was a friend of mine. Mm. And I kind of felt like these two assholes were responsible, but in the same, in my brain, I made a logic leap where I went, I'm doing this for my friend. So I guess I'll endure the company for a couple of weeks and, you know, I'll try to, maybe I'll try to be a, a, a good influence and make some you know, I'll try and uh, I'll try and, and talk to these 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 fellows about their behavior, see if I can't help make some adjustments, because I'm, of course, a pillar of moral uh, uh, turpitude. Right. Like I I, of course, my fucking compass is always pointed uh, due north. And and uh, why not? Why not me of all people, yeah. the full blown alcoholic at the time, you know, who was already just clearly made a terrible decision. Why not me put myself in this role of being, you know, the uh, uh, the uh, the moral objectifier, if you will, who sits in the back seat and goes, have you guys thought about your behavior at all? Because uh, that's how I justified it in my head. But really, I was like, it's good money. It's work. You know, you have to work with people you don't like sometimes. Um, but but then I had to consider my friend. And I did. I was like, my friend has been through some really shitty things. And it's because directly related to these two assholes. Right. So I know that if I go out, I'm going to have to answer questions. But in my brain, I was like, you know what? I can put the fire out. I'm pretty good at, you know, the politics of like personal, interpersonal relationships. I can fix the dynamics. I can tell them. You know, but I knew it was wrong. I knew it was wrong. And I did it. I did it specifically because it benefited me. And I honestly didn't. I mean, I did care that these guys were pieces of shit, but not enough that I said that I could have said no at any time. And I knew 
what the um, ramifications were going to be. And then I went out and we did these shows. And I'll be honest, there were benefits. I made a lot of friends. I made a lot of connections that I was able to use later on and build, you know, a, a real nice route where I could, you know, I still stay in touch with these people. Um, but the car rides and the, um, the conversations I had with these guys were just empty and uh, fucking a lot of like backpedaling and not any attempt to like take responsibility. And, and by the third or fourth day of this trip, I was like, man, I am stuck in this car with these fucking soulless ghouls and the shows are fine. They're fine. But I, I kept the closer we got to the end, the closer I knew that like, when I get back, my friendships are going to end with these people. And there's no fucking, there's no viable excuse. And I even like, I even did a Hail Mary pass. And I, I was like, hey, you know, if you guys feel any remorse, because they would tell me like, yeah, I mean, maybe I went too far. Maybe I, but I don't know. But, you know, and I told them, hey, why don't you guys just, when you get home, why don't you just write an apology and actually write it, write a letter. Yeah. Don't send a text. Don't write a letter. Tell them that you fucked up. Tell them why you fucked up. Try to make it. You know, you may not be able to repair it, but maybe you can at least, you know, keep from burning the bridge completely to the ground. And uh, I thought I'd made an inroad, but I made it worse. I made it even worse because these two assholes don't have any empathy. So they just wrote two letters to this poor person they've already victimized uh, and put through the ringer. And then their apologies were just like, well, I'm sorry if you feel this way, but so then, then this person who is actually kind of a famous writer took these letters and then was like, holy fuck, they made it even worse. How did these two assholes make it worse? Mm -hmm. And then they were like, well, you know, Derek Sheen told us to do this when he was on the road (laughs) with us. And then it was out. And then it was out. And I was like, for a few days, I was coasting. And I'm like, nobody knows. I did that. I'm going to be okay. But I kind of feel like it's coming. And then it hit. Mm -hmm. And it hit. And then I, I mean, the level of disappointment, I don't think I've really experienced that. I've experienced it in like relationships where people have dated me. And they're like, buddy, why did you do this? Like, what has happened to you? But I, I, but that's different. Like, I had a different kind of trust with with this person, especially, and it was, um, it was incredibly difficult to hear just how angry and upset and disappointed they were because they were like, you knew that we had a, like that they had been an asshole to me. You knew that. You knew that they were shitty. You knew that they didn't have any empathy. And yet you went and did this. Like you've had dinner. The the sentence that reverberates in my in my head from from their letter to me that they wrote me was, "You've been in my home. You've had dinner with my family, Oof. and you still didn't consider my feelings enough to just completely disrespect my safety and allow these people to be part of your life." And I'm like, "Oh shit." And they were like, so as far as I'm concerned, I'm cutting you out forever. No matter what you do, I will never have another thing to do with you because I cannot trust you. And it like no benefit of that trip, not a, not the money, not the connections, not the lifetime of friends and support that I made while trying to circumlocute all this shit was worth any of it. Because I realized at the end of the day, like, it was all perpetuated by self. All of it. It, it was all about self-sufficiency, self-support. Uh, it, you know, I made no sacrifices. And I did nothing that benefited anybody else in any way. It was all for me. And so when I really started to boil that down and look at how I, um, how I allowed myself to somehow try and justify shitty behavior, you know, as a benefit in order to save a friendship, that's when I realized that, you know, first off, my ego um, needed to get checked pretty quick. But, but I also realized like, wow, you can like, 
you can you can legitimately there's some things you can't fix you can't fix them in the mix you can't go in and do it in post like you have to think ahead about other people's feelings and this lesson kind of became like um it had little concentric rings that went out afterwards that reached a lot of different areas in my life like Mm -hmm. i had i just i had lived such a weirdly blessed life where i could just be completely selfish and uh and isolate myself from anyone's feelings or or concerns because i was real good at like you know soft shoeing my way through it and but then when you're an adult um that shit's like people are tired people aren't kids anymore and so they don't have the space to give you to go like all right well you fucked up again but i you know what we're young we're we got a lot of i was in my 40s you know, and that's a hard lesson to learn when you realize like, oh, I broke something and it and the damage I did is irreparable. Mm -hmm. And I did it to people that I cared about. And it wasn't even like, the lesson I learned is that, um, you know, it's it's all about uh, ego and permanence. Like, I really have to think about what I do and say, and I do this in stand up. You know, I mean, this is something that again, concentric circle, like I really made me examine what I say and why I say it and who it might affect. And so the, the lesson for me was, you know, almost having a a sense of three dimensional thinking, which I hadn't had before. Mm. It was always about cause and effect. And that was it. And very basic cause and effect. If I do a B will happen and that's it. I didn't think about, you know, looking at things in terms of an outline and and even in my standup, I would say things and, and they would be hurtful because I didn't think them through outside of, you know, the basic need of like, these are words and I'm saying this and then it's done. Yeah. And so after that, after I lost those friends, which I will never get back and um, and they were really good people, um, it really made me readjust the parameters by which not only like professional decisions, but personal decisions. I really have to think four or five steps ahead about, because I didn't realize, first off, I'm probably a sociopath. So I didn't really think far enough ahead about other people's feelings. But, you know, that's that when you mentioned lessons learned, that's the still, I think, the hardest lesson I've ever learned, because I've 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 lost things and and I've lost people. Uh, But those are things that, you know, in, in most respects, they're out of my control. But I willingly like walked into a working friendship and just broke it on purpose because I was late, too lazy to say no, too scared to say no, uh, and also didn't have any consideration for anyone's feelings. And I, it just didn't occur to me. You know, I just didn't think that far ahead. So, uh, you know, it's a shitty lesson. I'll probably... You know, uh, honestly, I'll probably be on my deathbed and I'll still have regrets about how I handled it. I'll always have regrets because I, it's something I can't fix. That's wow. That, that definitely, that's one. That's now, watch, one, now this is where you're like, when I say lesson, I meant like, did you learn guitar? <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, I'm just like, uh, yeah, man. I mean, that's great and all, but. I see there's a couple of guitars sitting behind you there. I um, thought you were going to talk about cooking. And uh... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, you know, over the last couple of years, a lot of people started baking. A lot of people have done bread. I, you <laughs> this, know, I... this show is only five minutes long, Derek. It's just about something <laughs> simple you learned over the summer. Oh, my God. <laughs> I've got I've to go make some calls. <laughs> this reminds me of a it. There's a story. There's a story that I lived with, like, I lived with seven dudes at one point because everybody does. And, yep. and in my early twenties and one of the dudes was an older guy who had a crippling drug addiction. And he was like the, like he was the older dude in our house. He was like in his mid thirties already and shit had not worked out for him. Yeah. And he was living in a house full of like 20 year olds who were, you know, all getting our life, figuring out who we are. Yeah. And he would just fucking every morning, he would just kind of shuffle around the house and just fucking doing pills and getting high and never really said anything to anybody. Like he really never talked to people. Mm-hmm. Very insulated dude. Paid his rent on time, but stayed out of everybody's way. 
And one morning we're all in the living room hanging out and, um, and he walks in and he looks real forlorn and, and he just says to the whole group of us, he just goes, uh, can't make it stop, man. I just can't stop it. And my friend goes, Hey, Hey, you know what? This is a big, this is a big step, dude. Look, I know right now you feel powerless and a lot of it is you just, I mean, we're here for you. If you need us to help you walk through something, I, I, I know that you haven't really talked to us a lot, but know that we care, we care about you. And, and if you feel like there's something in your life that needs change, you know, we're here to help. What do you need from us? Like, we're here to help you. And this is a big step that you're coming out and you're saying this. That's, that's huge. And he goes, uh, fuck are you talking about? I mean, the VCR is stuck. I can't stop it. Does anybody know how to stop it? <laughs> and that's so <laughs> that's a life lesson like that's <laughs> addiction i got bigger fish to fry man i got fucking yeah. maury taped in there I'm trying, to, I'm trying to see who the damn father is i got home alone 2 jammed in the vhs people i can't get it out man <laughs> I also just like the just that that deposition. I can't I can't make it stop. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> that's the first time he talked to us in like a year and a half. Damn. So we that's like, how that's how bad it was. That's how he bad was like, the jam was. Oh my was. god, he is really coming clean, man. It must have really broken whatever's happening. We're here for you, dude. You want you need treatment, you need outpatient. No, I just need somebody to get a butter knife and get this tape out of there, man. <laughs> I need a Phillips. I may be a flathead. I don't know if they changed the screws in there or what. <laughs> but hey, I really appreciate it, guys. Thanks. And you have tiny hands. Could you come over here and help me yeah. real quick? Oh, little guy. Little guy. <laughs> what's uh so what's like a quick backstory on you just for people? I mean, you kind of mentioned comedy, uh you know, kind of the big things. You mentioned comedy, you mentioned living in a house with a bunch of dudes, all right? I feel like I know you fully now, but just in case people aren't familiar, what's like a quick kind of quick backstory, backstory is um, young mother. Uh, so mother in my inner teens, I uh, grew up with a uh, terrible stepfather, but still had a, you know, weird family environment, moved out of my house when I was 13, lived on my own for a while, um, kind of had to, you know, make ends meet. And still try, you know, you end up doing things like trying to finish school, but uh, living living on your own in your teens is weird and it uh, changes your worldview a little bit. Uh, but I've made jokes about it because like I also in high school, like I, I had my own apartment, which was weird for some people, you know, that I lived, at, you know, 16, 17, selling carpet. I had a daytime job where I had to wear a little suit and sell carpet carpet remnants at a Nielsen brothers. And then at night I worked for a janitorial company. And then I would come home to my roommate who was a 35 year old, twice convicted registered sex offender. Um, and the reason I was living in, in an apartment is because it was rent free because his mom ran the apartment building and said, Hey, if you promise to keep an eye on my kid and let me know where he's at, you can live here as long as you want rent free. <laughs> so, I've learned a lot of lessons. Like, uh, I think my whole life is just like, uh, it's all anecdotal chunks. Yeah. I don't think there's, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a moment where I haven't been like, Oh, well that was fucked up. That's something yeah. like I've been fortunate to have like, uh, uh, a, a very crazy life that I, luckily I was able to transfer it into stand up. Uh, I think a lot of people don't know how to like, process uh you know whether, whether it's like trauma or loss or abuse or whatever and so you fall into other things and i was like oh if i joke about it then it feels better like if i can make fun of it then my dad you know my stepdad who was shitty i'm like if i can make fun of my stepdad he'd hate that so i win mm -hmm. right like if he knows that i'm happy and i'm laughing about it that makes him feel like shit which that's a win yeah. um so I, I think I learned early on that stand, like comedy or laughing or humor is uh, a, a way better uh, defense mechanism than uh, anything you can do with your hands, you know? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I, my backstory is, uh, you know, a uh, lot of uh, goofy, weird, shitty things because I had a 
kind of weird fractured childhood, but it made me into a um, made me into an interesting adult, if nothing else. Cool. Interesting adult, not not cool, but interesting. <laughs> what? So then, how long have you been doing stand up? Seventeen years now. Okay. Like I did it as a kid. I, I fell into it pretty early on because my mom really wanted me to like she forced me into comedy. Oh wow. Because she loved stand up. She had a really shitty life and she didn't like so she liked comedy for the same reasons. She would yeah. you know, that's a lesson she taught me. If you can laugh at stuff, it can't have power over you. So we had comedy all the time in the house and she really pushed me into it because I think she just vicariously wanted to live through me doing it. So I did it mm -hmm. as a kid and it sucked. Because fucking kids aren't funny. Yeah. Like, they're cute, and they'll say cute things, but they're not funny. Because yeah. they had, they've had no life experience. That There's nothing a kid can tell you as an adult where you're like, oh, that's an interesting take I've never thought of. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. Huh. Like, they're still discovering things like calendars and, like, door stoppers. Like, these are all new to them until they're, like, 12. And I get on stage and be like, have you guys ever? And everyone's like, yeah, we have. Yeah, we have. So I, I, I got, um, I got real bad stage fright as a kid because of the pressure of like going in up in front of adults and trying to like, like, Hey, let me try and make you laugh. And they're like, you're a kid. All you're going to do is be cute. And then I would just, this tension would come through me and I'm like, Oh God, I'm terrified. Mm -hmm. So I didn't do it again until my mid teens and it was still there. And then I discovered music because music, uh, you can hide behind a lot of things. And there's multiple people usually as well that will also shore up your mistakes. Yeah. And so you're not the, the central focus. So I could still be on stage, but I didn't have to worry about being alone and, and blowing it and feeling like shit. So I, I really fell into music hard because I wanted to be on stage. And that was great because it gave me the strength that I needed to like be up there and, and learn how to like, you know, have that sort of armor, that's that sort of stage health. And then when I felt more confident, I was able to like put my instrument behind me and go, let's talk. I want to talk again. Mm -hmm. So I didn't start doing stand up until I was 34. Um, oh, okay. I mean, I like professionally, like I, I really like, I, I, I got rid of everything. I, I quit my band. I almost, you know, I went down to part time and I was like, I'm just going to do it. And then I proceeded to make every mistake absolutely imaginable for every every young comic it's not it doesn't matter how young you are if you just start comedy you're gonna make all those mistakes it doesn't matter what age you are yeah and so i made all of those at an older age like at an accelerated pace uh you know like stand up man when you when you start it if you stick with it it like changes your like it changes everything about you it 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 fundamentally you have to break yourself down to the most like barest, rawest element and rebuild yourself. You have to relearn how to talk, how to communicate, how to, you know, it's not just talking in front of a group. It's not a, um, a mechanical, it's a complete like readjustment of your brain and your yeah. brain chemistry and it, and learning how to not die while you do that. Also essential because it's fine. You know, it could be years of just constant failure and eating shit and trying to find out what kind of person you are. I think it's a unique experience unlike any other, uh, you know, it, if you stick with it, it's a real learning process about yourself. You're just constantly discovering new stuff about your, your, the way you think and, or changing the way you think all the time to adjust. And it's, 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 it's unique. It's hard for my friends that I've had that aren't comedians to understand it. Yeah, it's uh, one of the best ways I've heard it that really clicked for me personally was, it, I mean, when it comes to just like, let me think, because there's two things I want to say. Um, when it comes to like performing and writing stuff and when people just say, oh, I'll just get up there, you know, and I talk and I'm, and I'm the funny guy in my group. So like, it'll be easy. I'll just get up there and say wacky things. It'll be fun. But it really is a one-sided conversation unless you're just having, you know, unless you're just doing one-liners and there's no kind of through line or overarching, you know, 
theme or, or story or this or that, it, it really is a one-sided conversation. So you have to learn how to, again, have a conversation with the audience, except no one, you're the one who's pushing all of it, unless you're doing crowd work, which even then you have to kind of have an anchor or, you know, an out to know when to go. Otherwise, then the crowd is going to completely dictate it there. It's just going to go completely out of your hands, out of control. Um, so you have to learn how to do that. But then, like you said, it's and we talked about it, uh, I think, with Taylor Clark in the first episode. Uh, it's you're looking at the world very differently because uh, we were talking about the similarities between uh, comedy and like skateboarding. He skateboarded. I rollerbladed as a kid. And even with that, you're mo- you're looking at the world completely different. You're moving through. You're looking at buildings. You're not seeing the whole architecture. You're seeing little things that people would say, oh, that's on the ledge. That's a rail. What are the issues with it? What are, you know, kind of the the pros of it versus the cons? So it's like you're looking at things differently that way. And then same with comedy. But with comedy, it's not just like physical things out in the world that you can see. It's literally it's that. But then it's also every other thing in your life. And so <clears throat> that's what that made me think of when you say that. But then thinking about it, too, it's like. I can, as I move through a comedy and get deeper into it, not to say like I, I understand or I sympathize with the people who go a bad route with it, but I can kind of understand it, especially once you, if you've been in it for a long time and then you, and you are famous and successful and this and that, it's like your, like you said, your worldview is kind of so warped at that point. Because even just going from, I feel like, no one to someone, even that change is crazy. Because you're like, man, I'm used to struggling or kind of being low on the totem pole and having to fight and prove that I'm funny. And I'm sure it's, you know, uh, uh, what's the word? Um, Not relaxing, but it feels good because you're like, oh, okay, I got you know, a fan base, I got this or that. But then as time goes on, it's like, how does that shift? You know, when you spend X amount of years, and it is great when you start out, because it's fun, it's new, it's exciting. Oh, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. I like it, I'm grinding, I'm working hard, you know, I'm putting all my my life and my soul into this, and I'm trying to get better. And like you say, you learn about yourself, and then this and that. And then I don't know. I just feel like I feel like I kind of lost myself there. No, no. I, I see what you're saying though, too, because it, it, it like there's also levels to it. Yeah. Because you know, as you as you as you progress in your craft, right? You'll always like the step that you you're looking up to. You'll get there, and then you'll be on that step with the people that are on that step, and you'll look down and go, "Oh, well, that's not that didn't." that wasn't that far. Like for some reason, I thought that everybody on this, this level that I'm at Mm -hmm. was light years ahead of me, but we're all in this same place. And then the step above that, you're looking up there and you're like, now that is different. I, that's crazy when you get up there, but then you find yourself there because you just progress, you know? And, and that might be like the middle place. Right. And the people that are there all struggling at the same rate. They're like, I I want to get commercial work or I want to, I'm submitting writer's packets because now you're at a place where you're being, you know, your your productivity and your your ability to create the channels are more wide open, right? Like you've spent enough time in the trenches that your aspect ratio has gotten wider. And so you start to see things differently and goals change, right? But like it's it cuz all right. What I was thinking when you when you were saying that is like this 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 last weekend was a really interesting uh, sort of a panoramic view of what success is and and like what its values are depending on where you're at like what what I what, like what I think is successful now is wholly different to the person that I'm putting that on right so mm-hmm. for instance um let's look at this like a like a weird comedy generational thing like I got to open for one of my heroes and I've done it you know, I've done it before. I've been very fortunate to know the person. So I, I get to do it occasionally. And they're, they're amazing opportunities. But I see myself on that middle tier, right? And so the the people that 
that you know that look uh, how do i say this without sound like a like a, there's like there's ego involved but like yeah yeah the people on the step that haven't reached where i'm at yet are looking up to me so you know not necessarily in regard i'm just it's a physical thing you don't have a choice you're looking up right that's the step you're going to get to at some point right uh, not the uh, editorial you um not you <laughs> you're gonna get there <laughs> i mean when you're at that place, you're looking up and you're like, oh, shit, that person that I know is doing a, a, an awesome thing. Yeah. And so in, in my brain, when I used to be there and my friends were doing that, like, I remember when Hurry Kondabolu, uh opened for, I mean, he got to open for everybody in town. Like, that was his, he was, he was that person who was on that step. And I knew them, but I was also looking up at where they were at. They'd done all the hard work and they climbed up and I'm still here doing the work that I need to do before I can get up there. And I would think his life must be insane. It, the opportunities and the things happening and the emails got to be crazy all day. It's got to be getting up at like eight and trying to like, what do I say yes to? What do I say no to? My life is just a constant struggle of, uh, you know, uh, uh, but of opportunity. It's an oppor- a struggle of what opportunities are going to be best for me. And, um, and when I got there and when I got to that step, I was like, oh, no, it's not like, it's a struggle all the time because you're now you're you feel like you have some establishment, but it's constantly clawing at, you know, whatever you at whatever you can get, you know, at that point, because now you can't go backwards. Like there's no way you can go backwards and just go do seven open mics a week, twice a night or whatever, because you have to start thinking about I need to be out. I need to be booking myself. And when you get those bigger opportunities, it makes your head go like, oh, this is where I'm supposed to be. But it's not. They're just opportunities, right? Yeah. And then so so then you get to the next place. And um, like when I uh, when I got to open for um, one of my buddies who was like, you know, one of my comedy heroes in my head, I thought that person was so crazy rich and so wealthy. And I was like, you probably don't even like think about where the next paycheck's coming from, where the next meal's coming from. They're at a place that's elevated. And then I found out from them that like, they were like, man, I got to do seven more of these gigs in order to get my car repaired. And I was like, what? Yeah. You know, I had to buy a nicer car because I needed the write off, but now the car needs repaired. So hopefully this, the next two theaters will help pay for that. And I'm like, Oh, I thought you were, I thought you, no, no, no. What do you, you thought that? No. Like I had to buy a house. I live in California. That, cost almost all of my money yeah like my, you have to work i have to work all the time i'll never stop working i have a pool it came with the house the pool is like a roommate i gotta pay you know every month it cost me two thousand dollars to have a pool and my i can't like he had no <laughs> reason yeah. and the theater he's like oh there's a hundred seats that aren't filled i'm losing my mind here this is money falling so i realized oh that's the level that you're at you're never gonna be you know you're always gonna look ahead and there's always steps, right? And so this weekend, I got to hang out with someone who is f- incredibly uh, uh, famous right now, right? They're on that step that we're all looking at and we're like, oh my God, it's your world. Yeah. We're just living in it right now. And um, and then they got a call from an even more famous comedian to go do an even bigger venue after the giant theater that they just played. And they were like, you know, me and my brain, I'm like, it doesn't get better than this. Like you're doing a 2000 seat theater. That's, that's what I want to be. I want to be at that place where I have a fan base that is that big that they'll let me do what I want. And then I'm like, oh, that that's not the end though. Cause that person is also like telling me backstage, like that's the level my, the place I'm going next with my friend who's even more famous than me. That's a level I don't want it. Like, I don't think I'll ever be there. Yeah. Like I I'm I've worked, I've I've strove, I've you know, I've I've carved out a niche, but I'll never be there. Like that's crazy to go from twenty thousand to forty five thousand people. Yeah. And then they told me that night, like later on, they were like, That wasn't fun, that was scary. And <laughs> yeah. and then the person that they're with who played that forty five thousand seat arena, they're not where they want to be. Yeah. Like they were talking about comics who were more famous than them. And so I went, oh, this just doesn't end. Yeah. We're never, ever where we want to be. But I think what makes you a healthy creative is the fact that you don't recognize 
where you're not at, you recognize what you need to do to get to the next place. And even if you don't reach it, it's it's constantly just how do I improve myself? And because mm-hmm. you'll never, you know, you'll never be the place you want to be. And and that's good though, because it makes you constantly be creative. It's Eddie Van Halen said this. Um, sometime some years ago, someone asked him like if he even practices anymore, right? You're so good. Do you even practice anymore? And he said, yeah, of course I practice because I don't, I think I suck. I'm not where I want to be as a player. And I I feel like if you rest on your laurels, you'll never get to that place. He's like, you may think I'm, I'm good, but, but for me, I, I don't feel like I'm that good. I feel like I could be better. That's nuts, right? It's a, a brutal honesty. It's a raw honesty to be that open. And he wasn't doing it to like get somebody to go, ah, Eddie, you're great. He legitimately was like, I'm not where I want to be as a, as an artist. And you never, I, if I stop and I think I'm where, where I'm at, I'll, then I'll get lost and I'll never get to that next place. Even if, you know, people didn't like the output at the time as an artist, you're always creating, right. And you're always becoming better. Again, like aspect ratio, like your the view of things changes the higher you get, and you start to look at things differently. And as a comic, I I don't think it's any different. It's a it's a craft, yeah. you know. And we're so much better than we were when we started. But I also realized, like five years ago, I thought I was re- I was in a really good place. I was like, I'm really my writing's good, and I'm feeling good. But then I go back and listen to this stuff from five years ago and I'm like, whew, I am so much better now, but I know that I, I, I'm also where I'm not where I want to be. I always can get better, you know? And so I, but I think that's healthy. I think it's good. It drives you to create. Yeah. Does any of that make sense? I just, I I just, uh, it I filibustered some, for five minutes. It, and again, man, I just want to hear about you playing guitar. That's all. But <laughs> <laughs> no, it it what makes if that complete, was the whole show. Yeah, I'm like, dude, something we, simple, and I just <laughs> we we went over it, and you're like, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you about the guitar in a second. But first of all, um, no, it makes complete sense, and it it uh, it's funny because it got me back to what what I was trying to say earlier, but from a different from a different way. Um, and it's, I guess, kind of with that, it's like definitely one, there's always someone better than you. There's always someone doing what you want to do. And it, it, it definitely, it's funny that you say that because it really is that thing where it's like, I think it's kind of once you, that viewpoint of, oh, this person, when you get here, it's all figured out. It's all, when you're doing this, boom, you got it, you know? And I think it, a lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of it has to do with one, just not knowing the business or whatever you're in. So you think, Oh man, if you headline a show in your city, then you're, you're doing it. But it's like, yeah, but you might not know really anyone can put on a show. Anyone who can go to a bar and be like, Hey, can we commandeer that corner for a couple hours on Friday night? And they're like, sure, you can, that's it. Then you pick whoever, then boom, they're headlining. So that doesn't, necessarily mean but it but it is kind of that thing of unless you know how it works it's kind of like oz you know it seems yeah. more more propped up and, and grand than it is um but the original point i was going to make that also now kind of makes more sense with that is like you said that constant fight of i want to be doing this or, and then once you get there Uh, Like you said, and that's funny that you say that because then you look back and you're like, ah, that wasn't as big as I thought, but this next thing is going to be what I think it is, even though that always happens. And every step you're like, ah, it wasn't what I thought, but the next thing, ah, but the next thing um, that mixed with, like you said, it just really stand up, just shapes how you see the world because you have to, you know, your opinion is kind of your job so you have to all right how do i make my opinion interesting or some people think i have to have an opinion on everything and and this and that so i think after doing that long enough mixed with that kind of fear not fear but that that insecurity of i'm not where i want to be or this person has what i want but how do i get it and this and that um i think that's 
again, not why I don't have like sympathy for people that lose it, but I could kind of understand a lot, you know, if you've been doing it for 20, 25 years, that's, that's kind of like that snowball. It's very hard to ground yourself yeah. and not kind of change by that. And then if you add fame and celebrity and everything that means in this day and age on top of it, it's like, yeah, I could kind of see why someone would lose it. And also like the people that don't on the opposite side, the people that don't lose it and do stay very true. I'm like, man, that takes a lot of work because we've talked about it in previous episodes and I've talked about it with friends a lot recently, but it's just like the amount of work it takes as an independent artist when you first start out or not even when you first start out, but once you, before, you know, you get a manager or things really start to, to happen for you, everything is on you. It's, it's not like, Oh, I do stand up, So I have to write the jokes and perform. It's like, yeah, you have to do that. But then to go to the next levels, you have to market yourself. You have to promote yourself. You have to learn how to book yourself. You have to learn how to travel, how to properly do that, how to book hotels, how to put a tour together, how to put runs together. And it's like, it's so much that you have to do that kind of the people that are self-made a little bit to me are, it's like, that's amazing. If you just kind of did your own thing for so long and then it took off, that's like, that's just so much energy and strength to not really like, you know, cause there, there definitely are days where you lay and you're like, what the fuck am I doing, man? You know, you're going to bed and you're like, I'm so tired of just having to do this and to just do it all. And like, is it paying off? Some days it doesn't look like it is. Then some days it does. It's like, that's so fucking tiring. So I think the people that do go that route, and stay sane, stay normal. I'm like, man, that's, that's a lot of work. That's, I think you get to a crazy. place like that. You get closer to the sky that you keep envisioning. And the scary thing too, is that when you're an independent artist, the only thing that's at stake is the things that you value, right? Yeah. Like safety, uh, comfort, you know, uh, uh, security, but when you get to that next step, the scary thing, I and I think just watching, you know, knowing some people that are at, you know, that that stage or bigger or even bigger than that is now it's no longer just about you and your security. Now people depend on you, too, mm -hmm. because when you get to that level, now other people have to get involved to help maintain it. Right. And so you do need a manager and an agent's probably getting involved to help, you know, secure all these things and make sure that your venues are insured and that, you know, you have security because now you're bigger and you have more of a footprint and you're more visible. And now the internet and people are like, I don't like your politics. I'm going to shoot you in the face. So now you have all this other stuff around you. Right. And so now you also can't go backwards because I'm sure the other fear is like, if I don't keep pushing, it's not just me. Now this guy's going to have, he's going to be out of work and this guy's going to be out of work. And it's yeah. like, it's crazy when you get to a certain place, because I feel like it's, I, I see two, uh, I see the split. I see guys that, um, that taste fame and they get to that level and then they don't do anything else. Cause they're like, baby, I'm here. I don't have to do anything else. I can yeah. just coast. I'm here. I arrived. And then they become fucking Jim Brewer because, <laughs> <laughs> because they expect it but they haven't done anything to grow as an artist. They've stayed right where they're at because they're afraid of losing it. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of have to do this thing where, you know, they can't create new material because the material they have pisses people off because it hasn't aged well. And so now they just lean into this other thing where they're like, I guess now I'm just a hard right. I'm an alt right comic because that's my audience. And now I just have to do this thing. And then you have to like parrot yourself for an audience of people that don't really like you, but they like that people don't like you. So yeah. they give you money and that's your audience. And that's the fame you're at now, which will never get better. Or you're someone, you know, that maybe you're Chappelle, maybe you're someone at that level who you have a lot of problematic viewpoints, but you're going to keep pushing through because it's the journey for you. So maybe you're at a place right now where, you have hit that level of fame, but also there's an awful lot in your circumference in your circumference because of the sphere of influence you have. So, you know, you're going to take a lot bigger hits more publicly, 
There's bigger risks financially, but also you have a lot of people depending on you to not become Jim Brewer. And so you have to keep pushing through. And I think, you know, I, I like using Chappelle as a, a um, it's sort of like a, an example, just because like, he is like right now the biggest comic on the planet, mm-hmm. you know, but I don't think he's done evolving as a person. I think he's in a really shitty place right now. And is, and I think he, and he put himself there and he, and I, and I think we're watching someone realize, uh, and they're, you know, people fight, comics fight. You fight when you're wrong. You fight yeah. when you're wrong. Cause it's just defensive nature. But I don't see him like backing into it and going like, well, you know, um, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm, I see him arguing, but I feel like two or three years from now, you're going to see a completely different person who's going to be doing even bigger venues, you know, and he's going to, and hopefully, and this is what I see because it's, it's an artist. I've watched that guy since the beginning is when you love your craft, you know, there are going to be points in your creative output where, you know, your personality changes, your thoughts change and you're, and you're at a crossroads and you can either Jim Brewer, David Spade, or you can, like grow even more and go, okay, I got to step through this. It's hard for me, but I am, I have to humble myself to my craft and realize that I'm still, I want to push through and see what's on the other side, you know? Um, And I think that's as a comic, that's huge because when you get to, you know, the, the next step is always about breaking through something, right? The next plate, when you crawl up to that next step, it's not just someone giving you a hand up all the time. It's because you broke through. You yeah. broke through a, a, a block and you got over it and you now evolved a step, right? You you unlocked an achievement. And so then you get up to the next step and, and you're always going to be faced with that stuff. And what makes you a good comic uh, uh, or a good creative uh, and separates you from just, you know, an entertainer is that constant, like, you know, you got to take your lumps and, you know, you got to, you know, you're always going to do and say the wrong thing, or you're going to make a misstep because you're learning. But what separates you is the fact that you can go, okay, I'm learning from that. Because again, as a comic, I don't think people realize, but again, you, your whole fucking brain is being rewired constantly. And so you're, you're never just the person. I'm not the person I was 17 years ago. I'm a completely different person. People that knew me back then don't recognize me now. Uh, you know, and not only because of my, you know, my, I've gotten older and I look doughier, but they don't recognize my thinking. They don't recognize yeah. the things I say and do because they've changed drastically because I've adapted and I've grown and I, my, I think you evolve differently because your whole job is a perspective. Your whole job is calculating perspective and then sharing your insights on that, whatever they may be. And so as the world changes and, and grows and the population gets bigger, you're, you know, you're hopefully your brain chemistry also keeps adjusting to that. We have to constantly change as people in order to stay relevant in an industry that's really, it's based on zeitgeist. Yeah. It's based on what's happening now and what do you feel about it and what are your thoughts? And, you know, you can be old man yelling at Sky. You know, I could be that guy and just be like, what's up with young people? And be Jim Brewer and be like, I'm a cockatiel, but it's actually a fucking parrot because he doesn't know what a goddamn cockatiel is. An idiot. Or, you know, you can fucking, you know, you can be Chappelle and, um, and take a, a large public hit and p- hurt a lot of people and try to work through it. Maybe it's wrongheaded. Maybe it's backwards, right? Maybe, uh, but you're watching someone who's struggling to be better. Yeah. And so, yeah, they're going to do it wrong, but at least they're not fucking JK Rowling. You know, they're not just feet planted and they're like, I don't like trans people. Yeah. You got to, you know, it's, it's a struggle to figure out like, well, how was I wrong? What was I wrong about? You know? Yeah. And so, and I'm only using that as an example because it's so polarizing, but I feel when you boil it down onto a smaller scale, like guys like, like me or, or, or in newer comics, 
it, you know, it's a constant struggle to grow. And you see people who stay at that level because they're scared of uh, discovering something about themselves or there's, or you get frightened by your own ego to admit that you're wrong. And so you just plant your feet and then you never move forward, you know? And that's like, that's my view of like guys like Jim Brewer and that whole ilk of like comics that their whole life now is just trying to offend people because they're like, that's my free speech. I'm not going to let some SJW tell me what to say. And it's like, that's just fear. Yeah. That's because you said something shitty and you couldn't say you're sorry. And now you've marketed yourself as that thing and you can never move away from that. You can never move forward from that unless you have a complete fundamental break with yourself publicly and completely change your operating system. You're going to be, that's the person you are now, you yeah. know, and that, and, and again, I mean, maybe this reverts back to my original lesson that I learned is that self and selfish selfishness uh, are not humbling traits. And when you realize that there are things that are bigger than you and more important to you, that maybe it's not worth risking those just for your ego. And so it's okay to be humble and, and have some gratitude and, and either make good decisions ahead of time. So you don't have to make apologies or learn how to say you're sorry uh, with some like uh, genuinely where a, a legitimate, you know, real honest awakening with yourself where you go, my behavior sucked and I'm sorry, but it takes a long time to get there. I think, yeah. um, Ooh, I'm actually, I was able to tie it back to my, okay. I tied it back to my original lesson. Well, no, that was good. perfect because as you were saying that I was, I mean, my host brain was going off. I was like, okay, how do I, how do I, but you'd like the whole, the whole time I was thinking, I was like, yeah, what you're describing, I feel like essentially is selflessness and, you know, understanding the world is bigger than my brain and what's going on in my head. So, you know, if, like you said, I offend someone or say something and that wasn't my intention, you know, you can either double down, which is never really good, or, you know, you can say, hey, I fucked up, I messed up. And then, you know, move on. Because um, comedy, you know, here's the funny thing. Comedy's not forever. And so, you know, one thing I, I realized that a, a fundamental, uh, a fundamental importance uh, as I got older was that at some point, it's not going to be about who I was on stage. I'm, I'm going to be old if I'm lucky. And it's the people that I had around me that I was able to keep around me. That's going to be important because I won't have stand up mm -hmm. at that point. I won't have that community to fall into of people who are like, you're okay. Come on in here. I'm going to, I'm going to, all I'm going to have are my friends. That's all I'm going to have left. And so the, you know, when I take those uncalculated risks, you know, not looking ahead, I don't want to be that person who is alone on their deathbed and isn't making anybody laugh or isn't, isn't laughing. And I don't want to be that person who, you know, who only looked at their career, you know, who only had ambition and pushed everybody out of the way to get there. You know, I, I'd rather make some personal compromises with myself about my humanity and make sure that the things that are most important to me really are my connections with people. And so stand-ups is a vehicle to get there. Uh, but at some point you can't rely on that, you know, and the big picture is what are you leaving? You know, what are you leaving behind? And I would much rather have my friends than a bunch of regrets. And yeah. so, so this actually, this goes perfectly one well said, very, very well said. Oh, thank you. Uh, but this goes perfectly into kind of wrapping things up the last little segment, just quick 10 seconds or less or whatever, just quick, uh, what do you think? I don't know if I should say the meaning of life or the purpose of life, but what it, what do you think is the most important thing, uh, I guess, in life? And two, what's one of your simple pleasures in life? Okay. Um, if I were to put a, a meaning on, on, uh, on any of this, because I, I feel like it's arbitrary, right? Yeah. Like the, the only reason we create meaning is because we're terrified 
Like we have to, it's got to mean something, right? Yeah, but it's, yeah. it's just, we just have a biological thing. And, and I think, you know, as, as much of a bummer as that can be, if you boil it down like that, um, truth of the matter is like, it's a journey. So I, you know, I get the reins for, you know, anywhere between 35 and, you know, 85 years, hopefully. And, uh, I, I think I don't have a purpose as much as I have, um, uh, learned that, uh, it's in, whatever we're doing is incredibly short. We're a blip on the radar. So as much time as I wasted early in my life, just trying to create some, you know, nonsensical meaning to it. Um, I, I think it's, it's learning as much as you can just taking in as much as you can and processing it and, and, and sharing it with other people. So they don't have to spend the same amount of time you did making mistakes so that their life can be a little bit more full of experience. And so I feel like if we all did that exponentially as, you know, as we hand things off, that as generations progress, their lives get a little simpler. They don't have to keep making the same mistakes. That whole concept of like, you know, you got to learn it by fucking it up and you're only going to learn by mistakes. I think it's kind of bullshit. I mean, I think there's a lot of things I was able to avoid because other people stopped me and went, you don't have to do that. And, yeah. and I feel like if my life, if I do anything with it, I hope that I provide some, some giant road signs uh, that, that it will be permanent. And they're like, you don't have to go this way. You can go the other way. It's quicker and it's less painful. And, and if anything, I mean, basis of experience is sharing. So that's probably what I'm supposed to do. Um, the one guilt, like not guilty pleasure, but the one simple pleasure I've discovered, uh, and, and we're going to take a bath once in a while. Just take an actual bath and, and make a fucking, make a, make a production out of it. You know, get a couple candles, go to lush, get yourself a nice bath bomb. You just need to soak at least once a month. You just need to draw a hot bath. You need to make it comfortable, put together a playlist, get a little baked. If you do that have a beer by the bathtub, whatever it need, whatever your vice is. And you just need to take an hour, just an hour with no internet, no social media, just soak, let your skin relax. And just for an hour, don't let anything inside your head, except a little bit of music, just relax and let it out. You got to do that. It, it's just the, it's the best thing. I didn't really realize. I always thought bathing was just for like, you know, it was just for cowboys, you know, you got to just get the dirt off, but it, or, you know, or for older ladies, it's, it's a bath. It's there for a reason. It's not for cleaning. A bath is not for cleaning. Do not look at a bath as a way to clean yourself. You're soaking in your own body filth. A bath <laughs> is just a, just a nice hour of hot soaking. Just soak your skin, relax, and don't let anything inside your head for an hour. It, it's the best. I rediscover this later in life. I can't say enough good things about it. Also, yeah, get some bath salts if you want. Step out there if you need to, but I'm a high, a high proponent of a bath bomb. Okay. Uh, less comes with it. I'm okay. not as tempted to smoke a bath bomb. I was going to say, don't smoke the bath salts. You hear me, Florida? We're talking Jeez. to you. Okay. They'll still do it. They'll do it. Why don't, are they? I mean, why aren't you just it, smoking regular salt? <laughs> yeah, there's plenty of salt on the table. Okay, why do you got to bring it to the bath? All right, just leave one place sacred, okay? Yeah, you get some pink Himalayan thing. sea salt. Have a weekend. <laughs> just go nuts. Well, Derek, this has been awesome. This has been amazing. I love it. Uh, where can people find you? Where where are you? Uh, DerekSheenRules.com. Derek Sheen Rules with a Z. Just okay. all my dates and stuff is up there. I don't have Twitter anymore. Uh, and oh, really? it's not a, by choice. I got, I got permanently suspended, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm on Instagram and, uh, find me there at Derek Sheen, six, 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 I think. Um, but go on my website or find me on title or Spotify. If there's still comedy on Spotify. All right. Well, 
You heard it. Title. Go to title. Go to title. Give Jay Z your money. Everybody yeah, loves Jay Z. Everybody loves Jay. He's married to Beyonce. Yeah. What, what more do you want? I'll support that a hundred percent. He can have all my money. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. This has been uh, very enjoyable. Thanks for having me. That was a really yeah, fun man. conversation, as always, with you. Uh, yeah, well, thank you. An excellent host, and uh, disarm any of my uh, uh, fear, and I just feel very comfortable talking to you. Thank you. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, and thank you for listening, for watching. Uh, as always, share if you like the episode. Tell a friend. It'll really be great. Or follow if you're not following already. I talked about all that in the intro. Don't worry about it. But thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. Come back next time. We'll be back with another great guest and another great lesson. Bye.